There we go. I landed at midnight last night. I apologize for that. OK, we'll jump right in. So in the long list of superlatives that you can use to describe Kepler and Gaia, let's go down a little bit. Um, I think stellar rotation will be one that the people in this room will appreciate for a generation. Before Kepler, uh, we knew, I would say broadly, the rotation of like a thousand, a few thousand stars. It was hard work, V sine i's, and for a handful you could do phase curves. With Kepler, uh, thanks to the incredible precision and years-long photometry that's available, we can take something that looks like this little animated rotating star, and we can transform it into a rotation period. Uh, so the thesis work by Amy McQuillan, working with Susanna Grain, this would be about Cool Stars 18, uh, showed us more than an order of magnitude increase in the number of stars with rotation periods available. Uh, so here we have um, the rotation period on the vertical versus the uh, implied mass from the kick, from the Kepler input catalog. 34,000 stars. Uh, and a diagram I'm sure we'll see uh, throughout the week um, is, is this sort of manifold that we expect that stars, perfect, that stars, uh, as they age, should slow down. They should lose angular momentum and sort of march up this manifold. Uh, we have handfuls of clusters sort of before and during Kepler that we could use to calibrate this surface. Um, and this is the so-called gyrochronology that we're, we've heard about and we'll hear about again uh, with Gaia later uh, today. Uh, so that implies that a star should sort of move vertically in this space, that a star here, say a M dwarf, stars that people in this room care about, uh, should march upwards in this diagram. And in principle, we could imply ages for tens of thousands of field stars directly. This is the, the dream, this is the promise of gyrochronology that many people in this room are working hard to fulfill. Um, now there's a lot of interesting structure in this diagram. The sun is here uh, near sort of this conspicuous edge in the diagram, uh, which we can talk about. Um, there's, you can see a little better here, this interesting structure as the M dwarfs seem to tip up here. Uh, there does seem to be an upper limit. There's lots of very rapidly rotating stars here. And I will draw your attention to further uh, an interesting sort of like bifurc bifurcation here, uh, a split uh, in the distribution. That's what I'll be talking about today. This was discovered um, in Amy's initial paper in 2013, just for the M dwarfs, that indeed the distribution was bimodal, uh, that there was a slower and, and more rapidly rotating chunk here, about evenly split. Uh, there's also the very rapid rotators, which is sometimes called bimodality here, the very rapid rotators in the hours to a day period. So there's a bimodality here somewhere around 10 to 20 days. You can see it again, the little split here in the distribution. The mystery deepened a little bit uh, when they extended the sample to all of the Kepler sources. Uh, and that this bimodality, you can see it in these clumps here of uh, range of the light curve versus period. You can see it for the M dwarfs. You can sort of see it for the K dwarfs. But by the time you get to the G dwarfs and the F stars, uh, there's no evidence of a bimodality. This is an interesting mystery. Two possible explanations were presented. Uh, the first is that it represents a variation in the star formation history. This is arguably the simpler explanation. Gyrochronology must work. And therefore, this bimodality represents a bimodal star formation history. The second, uh, and though it seems a little out of hand, it's uh, not totally unreasonable, uh, is that this bimodality represents a new unknown phase of stellar evolution, uh, some sort of spin down phase or Rosby number that is uh, jumped through quickly. Uh, and this uh, is not completely unreasonable to expect, especially considering the observation that it was only the K and M dwarfs. Maybe they are special. Uh, and the G dwarfs were tracing the star formation history. So how do we tell these two scenarios apart? Um, there's a few ways to poke at them and that I will discuss today. Uh, do we actually see the bimodality in F and G stars? I'm burying the lead here a little bit. Is the bimodality everywhere? You need something like Gaia. And can we connect this feature to other age indicators? Okay, so with Gaia DR1, which some of us haven't quite forgotten, um, we were able to filter out subgiants that were contaminating this sample. So there was a lot of these subgiants in Amy's original sample that the kick uh, mistakenly identified as dwarfs. And so this uh, period histogram here, before the guy filtering and after, we see nicely these G dwarfs actually do show a bimodal rotation period distribution. And this age, this dip here, corresponds to something like 600 million years 
uh, depending on what flavor of gyrochronology model you adopt. Uh, so that's the first test. Uh, the F, G, well, maybe the F, the G, K, and M stars all show a consistent bimodal gap. Now that was Gaia DR1. Of course, we are now gloriously in the Gaia DR2 era. This is the full catalog of uh, Amy's rotation sample, 30,000, 34,000 stars with good Gaia distances uh, and parallaxes, of course. Uh, and you can see lots of interesting structure here, the subgiants. There's binary stars up here. There's an incredible, glorious detail in this diagram. Um, I'll just brutally grab a box of only the clearly single main sequence stars. We'll throw out all these interesting subgiants. We'll throw out all these binaries, though I invite you to come talk to me about those. Um, and we're left with about 16,000 stars that are obviously single looking main sequence stars. Um, this gives us a more complete view. So in the inner regions here within 300 parsecs, we can see this bimodality again clearly. This is my PowerPoint uh, isochrone. Uh, again, this gap somewhere around 600 million years very clearly stands out, maybe even some other structure. Um, five minutes, thank you. Uh, some other structure, clumpiness that seems to be uh, visible. Uh, that there might be even more age structure in here. But again, you can see this nice track right here uh, clearly showing up uh, in the nearby stars. Now, Gaia doesn't work, DR2 doesn't work just for the inner uh, 300 parsecs. We can explore this as a function of distance. And we can see that as we march out, OK, within 500 parsecs, you can still kind of squint and see this little gap, maybe in the five to 600 parsecs. And then it starts to go away um, when you get out here towards a kiloparsec. Uh, this bimodality seems to disappear. When you do this in the correct direction, not just for distance from the sun, but instead galactic height, which we know to be an age indicator, this bimodal distribution here, I've smoothed it and centered it around a 600 million year old gyrochrone, or gyrochronology isochrone. Um, you can see that within about 100 parsecs of the midplane, the bimodality is very strong. And as you march upwards from the disk, uh, the fraction of stars, the young stars, declines as you expect. Um, so this looks like it is consistent with a burst of young star formation here near the midplane. Now, there's something unexpected that we saw um, when we were looking at this diagram. And you can squint very hard, maybe, and see there's sort of a yellow band here in the middle. Uh, this is not particularly colorblind friendly, I apologize. But uh, you have the single main sequence stars here, the equal mass binary track lying right up here. Uh, and then there's sort of a gradient in color. So let me blow that up and, and, and twist the color scheme a little bit. And indeed, we see a period gradient that seems to exist across the main sequence. Here, I've blown up just this portion of the main sequence. I threw out the binaries. Um, and we see this goes in this diagram from blue on the left to red, slower rotating on the right. Um, this is pretty cool. Uh, now, this here is the evolution you expect from uh, 10 to the 8, 10 to the 9, and 10 to the 10 gig years, or 10 to the 10 years, excuse me. Uh, for, a, for a K dwarf, for example. That would be a star right about here. Um, and you can see that during the, the first gig year, it kind of marches slowly redward. And then between 10 to the 9 and 10 to the 10 years, it actually makes quite a large uh, jaunt upwards and left. Um, this is somewhat inconsistent with what we're seeing here. Uh, we see young, presumably young, rapidly rotating stars lying uh, bluer and maybe fainter, and older, uh, slow rotating stars existing here on the top right. Um, this also, I'll note, goes the opposite direction of what you expect from metallicity, that the younger stars should be uh, metal rich and therefore redder, and they should, they should draw the younger stars to the right in this diagram. Instead, we see them clearly to the left, uh, which is sort of interesting. Um, perfect. So this has all been observations and games with just the Kepler field of view, uh, something uh, something over here. Uh, but of course, we have K2. And now, as we all heard, we have TESS. Um, this is going to let us use gyrochronology and rotation to study how localized this bimodality, i.e., this star formation history is. Uh, and on what spatial scales can we compare? We have lots of maps of star formation history in nearby galaxies from HST. Could we play this sort of games of understanding how clumpy the star formation history pattern is in our own field stars? Um, could we see the effects of spiral arm passages triggering star formation, if that is indeed how star formation happens? Um, I think there's some real interesting hope here. Uh, and just to uh, tantalize you a little bit, uh, we are working on this. This is a figure from an undergrad. Uh, I've been working with Zoe Bell. 
uh, who's been working to use the Everest light curves, like many other people, uh, to get rotation periods. Here you can see uh, Praesepi here showing up very nicely. But we do see evidence here. You can squint and see the bimodality showing up in the K2 fields as well. So it's not just an artifact of only the Kepler field, which is exciting. OK, and in my very last minute, a total left uh, turn. For the last six years, we've been studying the gender dynamics of questions and answers uh, in astronomy, mostly at the SS meeting, but also the last two cool stars meetings. Uh, there's lots I can say about this. We could give a long talk about this. Uh, come talk to me, Sarah Schmidt, Stephanie Douglas, a ton of people in this room who have helped with this study. Uh, the takeaway, men ask twice as many questions as women, especially when, even when you account for the demographics of the audience. And we've learned that the longer a Q&A period goes, the better the resulting gender ratio is. You start to approach the attendees' gender ratio instead of some skewed ratio. This brings us to two obvious conclusions. Let junior people, let women and minorities and people of color and disabled people who don't usually feel like they have the uh, opportunity and encouragement to step up to the mic, let them speak. And let them speak first. There's a triggering that happens when people speak first. Uh, and then I'm, I want to applaud the Cool Stars organizers for making sure we have long Q&A periods because when you only have one question, the person who's very confident in the front row raises their hand and gets that one question all the time. So let me encourage you to step back just a centimeter and help encourage the younger people uh, who are here for the first time or for one of their very first meetings. Uh, help them make Cool Stars a wonderful event. And with that, I will conclude that Kepler is awesome, Gaia is awesome, and you are all awesome. Thank you. Thank you, and I must say that the directions to the chairs said exactly that. Perfect. So, but we're looking for hands, and that's why I'm going to talk for a while, so <laughs> that I can find, yes, there's one at the back, white dress, right there. <laughs> hey, Jim, thanks for a great talk. Um, I'm familiar with this bimodality idea in uh, Elizabeth Newton's work, too. And there it seemed to correlate with, with H-alpha emission. So you mentioned other age indicators, but um, I, I wish you had more time to speak on it. Are you looking for other spectroscopic age indicators to sort out whether, um, whether that kind of signature is also present in the higher mass stars? Yeah, there's been evidence of things like von Preston gap and other kinds of bimodalities and structures that have been indicated by activity previously. I think, and Elizabeth can correct me about this if I'm wrong, I think her bimodality represents the, the chunk of very rapidly rotating stars here that are quite young, uh, and the sort of field age stars here um, that are older. So really, there's sort of three clumps. There's a very rapidly rotating clump here. Um, there is these two branches of the field star population. Um, but that's in the sort of several hundred million year uh, range. So I, I believe that's where most of the H-alpha structure you see comes from. These are all H-alpha active, chromospherically active, um, and that most of these, well, I don't know. When you get out here, it's an interesting debate. Most of these are chromospherically inactive. There's one over there. Yep. Um, thank you for this uh, talk. Identify yourself, please. Okay, sorry. Svi <laughs> Maze from Tel Aviv University, and uh, I was very pleased that you used our catalog of uh, period that we derived from Kepler, and I just wanted to ask whether your derivation of periods using the same autocorrelation technique, so one can compare the results or the or the samples. Yeah, what I've been showing is um, is exactly as Amy published it, uh, the auto the autocorrelation, her best autocorrelation function periods. Um, in the follow-up work we've been doing with K2, we've been doing a lot of comparisons between. Loam Scargill and autocorrelation. Uh, and you can chat with me and Ruth Angus about uh, what our plans are for, for doing it right, or at least sort of right. OK, two more, and then we'll copy. Yes. OK, my name is Saskia Hecker from the Max Planck Institute for Solar System Research. Um, I have one and a half questions. So here you say that uh, your conclusion is that, this, that it, this dip implies a dip in star formation. My question would be, what would cause this dip in star formation and other other uh, scenarios than the two you listed here that you can think of? Um, what would cause the dip in star formation? I don't know. I'm not the right person in this room to answer that. Um, you can imagine exotic things like, again, passage of spiral arms that trigger star formation, which would suggest that if you look this way versus that way along the galaxy, the stars over here should be slightly younger and these should be slightly older. That's not really supported in what we see in other galaxies that 
by 600 million years, by a giga year, uh, things are all mixed up. Um, so I don't know is the answer. Um, and I think there are other explanations for this. I think we could talk about variations in winds and, uh, and breaking. Uh, we haven't been able to account for abundances here. That could play into this. Um, I don't know. I think, I think I have presented it in a very simple way. That's what I would say. Okay. One last question over there. Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, where are you from and your I'm name? I'm Eliana Amaso. I'm from MPS, Göttingen, Germany. And my question is about what if uh, we are looking at systematics detecting rotation periods because of the uh, G, K, K, and M dwarf have this problematic with the amplitude of the variability and the irregular modulation of the patterns in the light curves as the sun. Then are you aware of that some of the methods are not able to retrieve these rotation periods? Uh, we definitely do see some interesting aliases. Uh, there, the autocorrelation function tends to do a little better in terms of not picking out the half period or the double period, uh, but it's not perfect. Thankfully, the bimodality doesn't, uh, it doesn't show up at a, at a horizontal clump, which would be suggested of a Kepler systematic, but K2 has a lot more systematic structure that we have to worry about. So I'm much more concerned there about seeing uh, clumps uh, at all masses at fixed periods. Uh, and then, as, as I think you suggested, there's, there's a bias that you're always going to see you see almost all of these rapid rotators because they're easy to see the spots are large. By the time you get down to solar age, the spots are very small. Uh, so we don't necessarily have a complete picture. It's very hard to invert this into a true star formation history because you're missing 60% of the stars out here or something, right? You're missing some large fraction of the stars as a function of age, uh, simply because they get fainter and harder to measure. Okay, let's thank Jim. Thank you. Your...